Well, thank you so much for that. This is actually my first time in Russia and my first time in St. Petersburg. And I don't know if everyone realizes this, but if you live in North America, you live in the United States, we actually like to name our cities after cities that came from this continent or cities that came from Europe or cities that came from Russia. So, you know, we have our own St. Petersburg in Florida. Do you guys know that? It looks a lot like this city is what it turns out. I didn't realize that, that you guys have the nice, warm, sunny weather with beaches and everything else. No, I, I say that only because this morning I woke up and it was snowing. I was like, wow, it is cold. So I am more used to this type of living. You know, in other words, I've lived near this part of the world most of my life, either here or uh, in Hawaii, you know, places like that, or Alabama, Georgia, southern states, so I'm used to the warmth. I just thought that was funny. So that's St. Petersburg, Florida in the United States. Okay, well, let's get into this. We're going to have a little bit of fun. And actually, you can kind of see here, I have a little live demo we're running. I'm going to have you guys also see if you can interact with it a little bit later. And one thing we need to know is, if can, can you speak to Bitly links? I've noticed that on certain networks here, the Bitly links do not resolve, but I know you guys know how to get around that. So there's a lot of websites I found when I got here that just won't resolve uh, back to the United States or back to other things. Uh, but, you know, a little VPN action gets around that. Okay, so we're going to have a little fun with that. So these are the links you guys want to be aware of. If you look at the bottom link here, it says Bitly Pipes and Pods. That is this presentation deck. It is a live Google Doc. If I make changes to the presentation, you will see those changes in real time. Also, all the supporting content up there for the uh, Knative tutorial, the Kubernetes tutorial, the Istio tutorial, as well as the demo you're going to see here in this presentation. All those links are there. And therefore, you have everything you need to basically try this at home. That's the goal. Yeah, you know, really, that's the mission I have here. So let's get into this and have a little bit of fun. And now, a couple questions for you. How many people here have been hands-on with Docker at this point in their life? How many people have done Docker? Fantastic. That's pretty much everybody. How many people have been Kubernetes, touched Kubernetes? Oh, right, a high percentage of you. Good, because that's the kind of audience we want. How many people just never raised their hand? Never raise your hand. Just one? Okay. <laughs> So that's a fun way to understand where you guys are at. We'll try to move through the introductory Kubernetes part quickly, and then we'll get into more of the interesting nitty-gritty stuff related to pipeline deployment, what this new thing called Tecton is, and what it means to you to, to run that on a Kubernetes cluster. Okay? This is a little bit about me. I go all around the globe teaching presentations all the time. So I do a lot of stuff with O'Reilly. I do a lot of stuff with um, you know, just generally traveling about. So just be aware of that. If you see me out someplace else in the world delivering a similar talk to this one, it's because I'm always traveling, it seems like. All right? Now, one more thing. You guys are familiar with the O'Reilly training platform. I actually run an intro to Kubernetes class, an intro to Istio class, and an intro to Knative class, three hours each on the O'Reilly training platform. And of course, it's virtual, so it's broadcast worldwide. So just be aware of that one. And a lot of this content actually comes from there. I also wrote this book, and we have it available at this link for free. It's just a simple, short little book on an introduction to Istio. And I'm going to spend some time on Istio today. Because what I wanted to show in this presentation was how you bring the world of pipelines and the world of virtual services and destination rules together. In other words, it's Istio combined with Tecton. That's primarily what my presentation will be about. So there's a free ebook for anyone who would like to have access to that. I see some folks taking photos. But remember, the link at the bottom gets you access to all the other links. OK? Now, this is something I love doing. You guys can tell me if this works for you or not. And I'll try to slow down my speed of English a little bit here. Am I talking too fast already? You can tell me I'm talking too fast. Everybody in Germany tells me I talk too fast. Seriously, it's like a German thing. I talk too fast for Germans. Um, I get that feedback all the time. <laughs> so let's, I'll try to slow down a little bit. But here's one thing I like to think about, is that we're all on a journey. We're all in this transformation of moving from where we are today to where we want to be. And one step on that journey is DevOps. And DevOps means cultural change. When I say DevOps, I mean cultural change. Process change, leadership change, organizational change, cultural change. We'll talk more about that in a second. And we're really not focused here in this presentation. This is more of a technical presentation. But I also like to think in terms of self-service and on-demand elastic infrastructure. For those of you who have been around the IT industry for a while, maybe you've been programming in this world for a little while, maybe you've been an operations person for a while, and, and actually that's a good question. How many people here are on the development side of the IT organization, development? All right, a fair number of you. How many people on the operations side, op side? Okay, I'm going to split 50-50. That's fantastic, because that's what we want. 
Okay? That's what we want. And so hopefully you guys will see a lot from the operation standpoint as well as from the development standpoint. But this is a key item right here, the self-service on-demand elastic infrastructure. It used to be, used to, old days, right? If you needed something as a developer, if you needed a virtual machine with a certain JVM installed on it or a certain version of Python or Node.js or whatever, you would have to file a ticket. And when you filed that ticket, it went to two or three vice presidents who signed off and agreed to that ticket. And then it came down to the operations person who tried to read the ticket and understand what the hell you meant and fix up that virtual machine. And then they sent you an email and says, here's your virtual machine. Here's how you log in. Do you guys remember those old days? Anybody still living in those old days? Right? <laughs> Just one or two? So I make that point because it takes sometimes weeks to get a virtual machine. It takes days to get a virtual machine. And think about it for one second. If you actually built homes, you know, houses, and someone told you you can't have a saw or hammer or nails for two or three days, could you be effective at your job? You couldn't. And so we have, we've done that to software people within the IT department. We actually decided that they don't need resources when they want the resources. They can file a ticket, and they can wait, and they can wait, and they can wait. So the point of this one right here is that through an API and some form of governance model and some form of built-in quota management, you should be able to give them the service they need right now. And so that's something that I like to think about because Kubernetes solves that problem. If I have access to a Kubernetes cluster, I can run my thing right this second. I don't have to wait on anybody. I don't have to file any tickets. I don't have to basically hope that someone will give me the right resource. I have an API. I can use a command line tool or a user interface, graphical user interface. And I have a quota to manage, you know, to make sure I don't go too crazy. And then I can run that thing right now. No, no ticket required. OK? Automation. Hopefully, at this point in our lives, we're no longer taking CDs and feeding them into CD trays. Anybody remember those good old days? We used to get this thing called MSDN, Microsoft you know, Developer Network. And it came in a box about this big, and it would have maybe 100 plus CDs in it. And in my case, in my data center, we would have a CD feeding party to upgrade our software. Because that's what you used to do, because the computer used to look like this, a mid-tower box or a full-tower box with a CD tray. And you would open that up, drop it in, do your Windows upgrade, do your SQL Server upgrade, do your Exchange Server upgrade, do your .NET upgrade, whatever it was, and then move to the next machine. So we no longer live in that world. And that's a good thing. We live in a world now where we can script everything. We can burn everything to the ground in a Phoenix server and rebuild it from scratch because we have that level of automation. And so we should be thinking about what level of automation we can have in all cases. Hopefully, you're also thinking about your deployment pipeline. That's really what we're going to talk about today, the concept of CI, CD, and deployment pipelines. And do we have some form of automation around the end-to-end -end workflow of what happens when something gets checked into source control and comes out the other end? Now, I know a lot of you here are no longer practicing the type of source control where we used to just simply zip up the so software and email it to our friend. You guys remember those days of version control? OK, we did that in university. We don't do that anymore as professionals. Well, actually, a lot of professionals still do that. OK? I mean, they have a, basically, they have it on a flash drive. They have it as email attachment. But we're going beyond that now. We're going to basically have source control. When we check something into source control, then, of course, the pipeline takes over from there is kind of the idea. And then, of course, advanced deployment techniques. And in the session, we're going to see blue-green deployment. If my demos work well, they're going to help me do a blue-green deployment. They're going to help me do a canary deployment. They're going to help me do a dark launch, as an example. So really advanced deployment techniques mean that if you're moving up this curve, you are moving ever faster. OK? And we've actually worked with a lot of customers at Red Hat through this journey. And if they just adopted the first key principles with a monolithic application, they could deploy as fast as once a week. So a monolithic application deploying as fast as one time a week. So if you want to go faster than that, that's when you get into this microservices world. right? You break up the monolith into different pieces so you can deploy faster than once a week. You deploy every Tuesday, every Wednesday, every Thursday, as an example. But this is my Bruce Lee version of this presentation. I like this so much, I've had this actually for years. This is the, one, the original version of it. You know, DevOps, self-service on-demand elastic infrastructure, automation. OK, CICD deployment pipelines, deployment techniques like the blue-green canary, and then you too can be a unicorn. I've had this kind of diagram for a long time, so I really enjoy it. But this stuff right here in the middle is where something like a Kubernetes, an OpenShift, an Istio, a Knative, a Tecton, et cetera, et cetera, can help you out. We're going to spend some time on that in this presentation. 
okay? This is the old way of DevOps. You guys hopefully have seen this diagram before, this image before. This is one of the original images associated with the DevOps movement from many, many years ago. Hopefully you guys have seen it before. And hopefully you're not practicing this any longer. But this is where the problem lies. If you have a situation where you think you can throw it over the wall as a developer, and you no longer have operational concern, then that is where it fails. So one thing I'd like to tell all the developers in the room right now, okay? For all you operations people, maybe you'll, you'll like this statement, maybe you won't. But for you developers, I want you to go back in time to that moment where you actually wrote some code for the very first time. I don't care if you're eight years old or it was just last week when you learned how to program for the first time. It might have been when you were running around school and you wrote that code, you typed it into the editor, you then saved the code, did you not? You edited, saved. Okay, you guys are still with me. Then you compiled the code, you still with me? And then what was the last step? You ran the code. And for some reason in big organizations, we've decided developers don't know how to run anymore. It's like they don't know what a computer does any longer. I'm always shocked by this. This is why we have this huge gap, gulf, uh, gap, gap gulf between development and operations. Operations is trying to make it run. So as developers, you need to be accountable for making it run better. As a matter of fact, I had a situation where I actually brought developers in on Saturday to watch the operations team do the deployment. Because our ops team, you know, received it over the wall, and Saturday they went to do the deployment for production. And always we found major bugs in the code base, major issues with the build. And so once we brought the developers on Saturday, the problems were solved. It was like magic because they were now accountable and responsible. They had empathy for how to make it run. So that's all I really want to say about, you know, cultural change. But let's talk about the pipeline. The pipeline, you can think of it visually this way and just think of it as dev, QA, staging, production. You know, you have an integration test in there, you may have a load test in there. It doesn't really matter what you put in there. It's just a series of steps which represent the workflow from where you have your code checked in to where it comes out on the other end. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Also, we have the concept of our application, all right? If you have a monolithic application, you could kind of get your arms around it. You could basically see it, understand it, all 45 of you working on it knew exactly what it was. Perhaps you could get the thing to build on a laptop. I even knew one team whose build infrastructure was to use Windows Remote Desktop to another Windows machine that had Eclipse running on it, and you had to click the button in Eclipse to do the full build of the application. Think about that. That was their build automation. Now, some of you are probably thinking, damn, that's pretty clever. Wish we thought of that. <laughs> but some of you are thinking, damn, that's pretty archaic. So just keep that in mind, too. How do you build that application it can be very important. But as we think about this application, and we start thinking about breaking it down into modules, these pieces, these component parts, and we start thinking about what it means to go to microservices, the problem is our application fades into the background. And these microservices start to distribute around a network. And this is where it gets crazy. This is where it gets strange. This is where distributed computing will, in fact, bite us. Because now we have a network connection between component A and component B and component C. We also have all our own data, right? Microservices says everybody gets their own database. Well, we know that's kind of tricky. If you definitely if you live on the operations side, you're like, what? Everyone gets a database? We can't even manage the one oracle that we have. And I appreciate that, too. As a matter of fact, there's a nice book on this topic. As I mentioned, we have free ebooks. So Ed Sienaga on my team, one of my colleagues at Red Hat, wrote a book on how to manage you know, the database in this microservices world. OK? Multiple points of entry. You might have multiple API entry points to that uh, microservice-based application. So now you need some form of API governance or API management. It used to be all you had was one uh, web front end with a big old ugly portal written on WebSphere or WebLogic. You know, and that's all it was. Now you have all these different places the users can poke into the application, either a mobile application through an API or a business partner talking to that application. So you have to be aware of this as well. This is now an operational concern that actually makes you know, things harder to manage, right? You get a lot of points of entry there. And here's where this gets interesting in my mind. All those different microservices and some of those databases can run as pods. So the pod is nothing more than the computer that this thing runs on. Your Java code, your C-sharp code, your Python code, your whatever code is running inside this Linux container, which is running inside this pod. And all the pod is is a Linux container or two or three or more. And we're going to see that. By default, if it's Knative or Istio, 
right? There's two little containers in that pod. And actually, one of the things I'll show you when we run our pipeline is there's 11 containers in my pod, OK? But you can have a container in that pod, and of course, your microservice sits in that container. So you can kind of mentally map pods to microservices in many cases. And then you have to overlay that pipeline concept. And this is where it gets kind of crazy now. Different teams delivering their component at different paces and different intervals with different technology, potentially. Some teams use Node.js. Some teams use Java. Some teams use something else and delivering that at different intervals, all right? So think of the old school versus new school. The old way was super simple. We knew how to deploy that big old monolithic application with our 50-person team. We could do it like clockwork. Every three months, we could do it. Every four months, we could do it. It might take someone all weekend. The operations team might be there all weekend to figure out how to get that thing running again. But we could get it done. So it just took a little bit of heroic effort. In the new world, we're now deploying this thing all the time. So this is what it looks like. Instead of every three months or every four months in a heroic effort, we're deploying every week, every day, every hour, all with different pipelines, different workflows, different intervals, and different technologies. So in this new world, this is where I say something like a Kubernetes or OpenShift to help you out. OK? All right. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about quickly with some key Kubernetes terms. You guys are familiar with the concept of the pod already. Most of you raised your hands about Kubernetes. So if you're comfortable with the pod and the Linux container that runs in that pod, you're well ahead of the game at this point. Most of the developers on this planet, most of the operations teams on this planet are still living in the world of virtual machines. Some are still living in bare metal, but many are still living in VMs, the previous generation of technology. If you guys are already up to speed on this concept of container, you're already well ahead of the curve. Hopefully, you know what a replica set or a deployment will do for you as well, because that deployment object is super critical for making that pod run and keeping it running all the time. It is basically how you define your template, if you will, around what those pods should look like. The pods by themselves are fairly ephemeral. But notice one thing about the pod that a lot of people miss, uh, miss when they first start learning about pods. They share the same IP address, they share the same life cycle, and they share the same volumes. And that's an important thing to understand, because you'll see that as we get further into this. Because something like Tekton takes advantage of those things. So that concept of being able to know that I share volumes, I share IP address, and I share uh, uh, life cycle is very critical. All right, labels at the far right of my chart here are very important as well, because everything is done with labels at this point. One of the things I always like to demo to new Kubernetes users is the concept of simply having a completely different implementation for a service, like I'd have written in Go, or Python, or C-sharp, or Node.js, or Java, and using labels, I can flip the network switch back and forth across it, right? The network service, the service you see here on this chart, because it doesn't matter at that point, right? The service and the network endpoint is separated from the actual pod implementation, OK? So this is kind of what a Kubernetes cluster might look like. You might have this concept right here of the API layer and uh, talking to etcd. Right? So you always have masters in the form of three. etcd needs three right, for high availability. So that's the database. You have an API, a REST way, a, uh, API over the top of it. Typically, though, you just use a command line tool to interact with that REST API, though you could interact with it directly. You have schedulers. You have controllers all within those master nodes, those three master nodes. And then you have your various worker nodes. And your worker nodes might be running Tomcat or Spring Boot or Wildfly or SQL Server. It might be all kinds of things. And so you basically are specifying the image like in this case, customer service 1.1.0, and the replica count. So that concept of simply saying, hey, Kubernetes, I want two of these. Make them run on one of those worker nodes is very important. So it would basically come out here and say, oh, great, I'm going to drop that Tomcat-based image on these two worker nodes. So that's an important concept to get your head around. These are just computers at the end of the day. They have CPUs, they have memory, they have network I.O., they have storage, meaning they can write to disk, some disk, whether it be network storage or local disk. And that's what you're using. It's not magic. It's not defying the laws of physics or gravity. Okay? It's just a computer that you're sharing in a very interesting way. Uh, and as a matter of fact, you should be really comfortable, hopefully, with this API. Because this API is where I believe dev and ops can collaborate together. So this is really the magic of Kubernetes in my mind. It brings dev and ops together. In the world of virtual machines, a lot of the developers may not fully understand what that meant. Okay, the fact that you use vSphere and ESX and all that to manage all those things at great scale, or you might be running your virtual machines over here on Amazon, or you're running on Google, or you're running on Azure, you have lots of different ways to manage those, and the developers often, you know, kind of apart from that. They're not aware of it. They know it's a computer, but they're not really sure how to get to it. In this case, with the Kubernetes API, the developer and the operations person can collaborate together on it. Okay? 
Now, there's some really key points that you should understand about a Kubernetes cluster. And I believe you guys probably know this already, but there's these certain object types that are part of that database. I like to think of them as the schema of that etcd database, the schema of that JSON or YAML payload going over that RESTful API. So the config map, hopefully, is something you guys have seen before. The deployment is something you might have seen before. The service, these are built in to Kubernetes API. But now it gets interesting. This is why it gets super interesting, because now we can extend that API with things like the virtual service from Istio, right? the serverless service from Knative, and they have one of those. They also have just a service. They just call it service, which is kind of funny, okay? from Knative. And you might even see like the pipeline from Tekton. So pipeline gives you, uh, sorry, Tekton gives you the concept of pipeline and task. And this gets even crazier still. I might want Kafka objects in my cluster. I might want integration objects in my cluster. And so this is a, such an important topic that I like to show you this in the form of a little demonstration if I can make this work. We'll see if this plays out as I would like it to. Okay, But let me just come over here and type in kubectl get CRDs. So if you walk away from anything in this presentation, know this command. Because no two Kubernetes clusters you ever touch again will look alike. They've always been customized in some form or fashion. The CRD, which is what I've, I've basically said, get CRDs on this cluster, look what it has. Because here's the coolest part about the custom resource definition. It's the way to extend the schema of the Kubernetes cluster to have these additional object types. And one of the ones we have here for Tekton, all right, grep Tekton, we'll see here we have this thing called a pipeline, a task, pipelines, pipeline resources, and those are the three things we're going to interact with. There's also pipeline runs and task runs. Think of these as the instances of those objects, the instance of the pipeline as a pipeline run. But now we have a, we have a pipeline now built in to the architecture of Kubernetes. It's a first-class citizen. All you have to do is know how to talk to Kubernetes with create, read, update, and delete, and you can now create, read, update, and delete pipelines. OK? To kind of make that point, though, let me go to another cluster. I have another one over here, kubectl, get CRDs, rep, and Kafka. OK, so come on, connect. There we go. So we also have Kafkas as an object type in this cluster. So to kind of make that point, let's go over here. I have a little YAML file. Here we go. Let me edit it. and. Dun, dun, dun. I was talking to Edson earlier, so I said it's called the Edson cluster. Well, yeah, let's just copy that. All right. So, oh no, let's actually do it this way. So let's call this dev oops. Dun, 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 dun. Commit the change. I'm just editing it on GitHub here. Not that this is best practice, but just to kind of show you what it looks like here. So there it is. See the kind Kafka here? So I was just talking to a gentleman earlier who basically have, they built out their application infrastructure on this same technology. You can also build your own custom schema definitions that extend Kubernetes, like if you want Kafka's or pizzas or beer or lasagna, dog, cat, it doesn't matter. You just have to build your own custom controllers to listen to it. Okay, so if I say, uh, let me, I'm just gonna use, in this case, a new project, let's call it, well, let's call it DevOps. All right, so I, did I do that right? Fantastic. And you notice I'm using an OC command. I could also use the Q control command. This is an OpenShift cluster in this case that I'm interacting with, so I can use either command for that. And so if I say Q control get pods, there's nothing in here right now. So let's do Q control create F and then paste in that thing I just edited over there. All right, and watch kubectl get pods. And so here's what's happening now. Based on the definition in this YAML file, in this case, I have a storage type ephemeral, but it's going to have three replicas of the broker, three replicas of Zookeeper. That is the proper production way to run Kafka. And look what's happening. It's now spinning up all the production resources it needs. If I had storage in there, if I had metrics monitoring, if I had certain JVM constraints, or whatever it might have been, I could put all that in the de camel definition or YAML definition, check that into source control, have a complete version of control of that, and now I can just deploy it by just sending it over to the cluster. And I'm really, I make this point because a lot of people have missed this concept of the CRD and not realized what the magic is behind it, but this is how everything is now implemented in the Kubernetes ecosystem. So I encourage you to go build your own pizza CRD just to have fun with it.
you know, just to play with it. And then there's different ways to write controllers, one of which that is popular at this point is the operator SDK. You can see, by the way, there's my zookeepers, my Kafkas are coming online there. And then if you go look at the operator, operator, uh, not that one, SDK, okay, operator SDK for how to build these things is a good example. And then if you look at operator hub IO, you can also then see what the operators are that can extend your cluster. So whenever you install one of these, you are now getting the K native, the Kafka, the whatever you see here, and that object type is now part of your schema. Okay, so just remember that. And that's exactly how I actually installed the systems you see here. So the fact that I have Kafkas now, or the fact that I have Tectons now, or if I, the fact that I have uh, Git CRDs, rep, Istio, that, that's how all these objects came to be. Okay, so I have these Istio objects now as well. So I have the concept of a virtual service. So that's how they got here was I basically picked them from Operator Hub. Okay, so just bear that in mind. All right, so I want to make sure we tell you about that. Let's see here. Yeah, let's go with here. And we're going to get into this and run a couple cool demos. So the thing that I really want to focus on today is this concept of Istio. I focus on Istio and Knative, and Knative, of course, begat Tekton. Tekton came out of the Knative project. Hopefully you heard about that already. If you saw uh, Meta's presentation earlier, you know, he was, he was talking about that sort of thing. But now we have this Kubernetes and OpenShift back in at the bottom. But let's kind of show you what this thing looks like in action, okay? This Tekton thing in action. What I have here is a couple little pods running. I have this blue, I have two blue pods. You see, I see that? And I have my little, simple little application here. And if you watch it, you would see it's just polling those two pods. Let's see, yeah, there it is. So notice this count right here. That is just something in the code that basically says, I have a new number and it's reflecting that number back out. All this is is simply you know, polling it, hitting up against it, no big deal there. Uh, I have a couple others of these. Let's see here. Okay, so it's a simple little application. So let's actually show you what that application looks like running in those two pods. Uh, here it is, it's a little bit of Java code and it's a little bit of jax for s and let me go ahead and just make a change to it. So I'm, I purposely, by the way, this is not good code or good practice. I want to illustrate the point. So I'm going to no longer be in blue mode. I want to go to green mode. And for green, I'm going to say bonjour. Okay, so I'm just changing the code here. All it's really doing is simply providing this little JSON packet back to the client. Okay, that's all that's really happening here. So it's going to say hello. It's going to basically keep that counter, right? There's a little uh, counter in here. Every two seconds, it's going to count the number up and basically return that back to the client. That's all that's really happening. Oh, and I do have a test. Let me find my test here. So let me make sure the test is right. I said bonjour. Okay, so as a developer, right, my, that's a very poor test, I respect that, but it is at least a test, you know. It would have caught me if I wasn't paying attention to it. And as a person who's programming, right, the next thing you do is you say maven package, uh, that's what you do, right? And that builds you your fat jar, right? That builds you your um, Uber jar in many cases. You can see it's going to run my test there real quick. And then my jar file will get created. And then, of course, I have this jar file over here. And I can say java-jar. And then I can, you know, uh, let's run that. And then so I'm running it right there. And then I can say curl localhost 8080. Helps if you spell localhost correctly. And I can interact with that piece of Java code, right? So it's a very, very straightforward little piece of code. There it is. It says bonjour now. Uh, and it's going to return a little color. That's how the color is changing. OK, so let me double check that I did that correctly. And just so I do this right. Yep, 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 yep. That looks good. So we're going to come back with green. And so now I need to actually um, uh, check my git, git status, uh, git commit. We made this bonjour and green. And I'm going to git push. OK, that's pushing it up to GitHub in this case. So it's going to send it up here to GitHub. Let's go here and look at it at GitHub. Just to double check that's here. Now it says bonjour. It says green there. You guys see that? OK, so at this point, we can have a webhook to kick off the pipeline. But I have it set so I just manually kick off the pipeline because I want to show you what this manual pipeline looks like. For one thing, there's a new command line tool called TKN. This is part of the Tekton command line tool. And you need to have Tekton resources and the resources pretty much are your inputs, your outputs, your, this is your, you know, what is my Git repo that I'm sucking in, and what is the image that I'm going to be creating at the other end, because that's really what we're trying to get to. Because in this old world, go back over here, right, after we did this, we would do our Docker build. 
right? That was the next phase if we were doing everything manually. We do a Maven package, we do a Docker build, and then we, of course, we have our Docker image to ship to somebody, we do a Docker push. In this case, though, I'm actually going to say start pipeline and let's run the green version of the pipeline. And notice Tekton actually produces this little thing right here that basically says, okay, here's your logs associated with that. And let me pull the logs up. Notice this pod that was created up here. Now, here's what's interesting. It's taking a little time, and I'll show you what's going on behind the covers back here. One of the reasons it's taking a little time is because a volume is being provisioned. In my case, this, is, this particular one is running out here at Amazon. This volume is being provisioned and shared across that, all the steps in that pod. Okay? Because this, this is where it's going to use its scratch disk to basically do the git clone, do the Maven build, do the Docker build, do all the steps that you need there. So those steps are part of what's happening in this one pod. There's actually 11 different steps in this pod. See the 0 for 11 there? And as a matter of fact, we can actually see these steps if we look at them from this perspective. Okay, so list containers, do that here. Here are all my steps. It's going to create the scratch directory, if you will. It's going to do the git clone. It's going to have a bunch of stuff in here just for echoing and things like that, because I put that in there. And it's got to do this build sources. That's the Maven clean compile package as an example. And of course, it's got to do the build of the image and the push of the image. These steps are locked up in this guy right over here. OK, so let's kind of walk through those steps and make sure we look at them quickly to see, so you can see what they look like here. Do, do, do. Where are they? Uh, dun, 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 not those, not the Kubernetes ones. I've got too many things in this directory here. OK, so these steps are listed here. Let's see here. Let's just close that. OK, you can see the concept of a step. And here's the concept of a step that's actually very important. It is nothing more than an image that you specify. So you can make your own custom image or any image you find out there on Docker Hub or Quay.io or GCRI or wherever you get your images from. In my case, I simply just said, well, let me just use the Fedora image because I'm going to have a little fun with this. I want to first list the files that are showing up in the workspace because the first step that I can control happens after the git clone. So if I come back over here and try to look at my logs, OK, come way back up here. You can see it's downloading the internet through Maven. But uh, da, 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 let's see here. Where were we? OK. Where did it start? That's our git, 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 git. Oh, man, we went too far back. OK. But you'll see all my little steps logging out here. OK, so build the Java app. There's the git clone. There's the ls build sources. See, it's doing nothing more than listing what's in that um, workspace directory. Because this is basically where it gets get cloned to, right? Workspace source. And then I'm going to do this echo. I want to echo the Docker file, because I want to know, did it pick up the right Docker file? And when I was learning this, I actually had a problem with it for a while. I was picking up a Docker file that I forgot that I'd left on my file system, the wrong Docker file. So what Docker file is it looking at? You know, let's cat out that Docker file. There it is. OK, so you can see this one's uh, from Fabric 8 J Java Alpine. I want to know that. That's important information for me. What is the image it's going to create? And you can see right here, this is the image that's going to get created within the internal Im Im image registry of OpenShift here. And now, when it says build sources, let's go look at build sources. Look what that is. It's just Maven clean package. And I did have skip text test here, because it's faster, just to get through it faster. I even have another pipeline where I have no build at all. It just does all the other steps besides the build, so I don't have to wait for the build. But you can kind of see that even here with the Maven mirror, it's doing a standard Maven build, downloading from mirror, right? And I have a local nexus inside this cluster, and it's just building within the cluster. So this is the key thing to understand. If you actually have a huge build apparatus, and in the case of Red Hat, we actually have several thousand machines for builds and continuous integration. Thousands of machines. Because we have so many things we actually build on and ship to customers. You guys probably have a builds farm of, what, 50 servers? Maybe 500 servers? We have several thousand. It's like maybe beyond 10,000 at this point. And so when you actually have to do that many builds, you want a very interesting way to scale out your build cluster, too. And that's really what we're talking about here. Not only can I run Kafka's, I can run my builds in the cluster. I don't have to worry about a developer doing the Docker build on their laptop anymore. And you know why that's important more than anything else? Not the scalability. But if a developer does the Docker build, you have no idea what they put in that image. You don't have any idea how many CVEs are still in there, critical vulnerabilities and exploits, how many backdoors they have running in there, or better yet, their Bitcoin miner now running in your infrastructure. You think I'm kidding? Anyone here? My ops people, 
Have you had to throw a Bitcoin miner off your infrastructure before? Anybody? Yeah? Now, developers are like, what is he talking about? Exactly. On the ops side, this is stuff we have to worry about. At Red Hat, we are constantly finding Bitcoin miners trying to run crap on our infrastructure, and we have to toss them out. Now, so this is important. You don't want to give the developer the ability to build an image any longer if you can avoid it. You want to basically give them the source code, and you build the image in cluster, scalable, safe, CVE secure, et cetera, et cetera. That's really the idea behind this. So here I have my build sources. So you can see it, it's doing a full build here. Build, 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 build. You know, it's all the standard Maven build, nothing unusual here. OK. And let's see. Oh, and it's already run to completion. Let me move this down a little bit. It's already ran to completion. And notice I now have two green pods that have showed up here. So it actually ran in two uh, tasks. So the first task was this 11 steps you see here. OK. Notice also, when I say Docker build, I'm not using Docker. I'm using a tool called Builda, which is Red Hat's tool for doing an in-cluster or daemonless or rootless build. This is important. You can do a, an image build without having cluster admin privileges, without being root, without having a Docker daemon, which opens a port to the internet. You want to lock all that down. So from a Red Hat standpoint, we wanted all that secured. And so this is a highly securable build tool. Google also has one called Kaneko. Right? They also have an in-cluster build tool called Kaneko, and there's other build tools that are on the market. But your Docker build is no longer a Docker build. It's some other tool. Okay? So build, in this case, does the build. You can kind of see it over here. It still uses our Docker file. So the Docker file input is still the same. And then, of course, you're going to do the push. Okay? You're going to do the push to your registry, and therefore your image is going to be created. And once that is done, that is all that job is supposed to do. And then I just have a little fun with this. Now, there's a lot of different ways to do this next step. Okay? You, can have, you, know, uh, you can have different versions, uh, solutions to basically manipulate the deployment YAML. This is actually very straightforward. It's going to grab the deployment YAML. Okay? That's why it says it's going to echo it, it's going to cat it. And then it's going to use this tool called YQ to manipulate it. Okay? In other words, it's going to manipulate it with the image that was just created. That's all it's really doing. And keep in mind, this is all occurring within that pod on that scratch disk, that workspace, it's not impacting my GitHub repo. Okay, it's just happening right here. So there's a lot of different ways you can handle this. You can see then what happens is, right here, it's going to do the cube control, apply, dash F, and the resource file that was just updated by YQ here, tweaked. So it has the correct version uh, information, and therefore my green pods come to life. Now here's what's cool about this. You can kind of see my blue pods look like they're unimpacted here. In other words, my application from a user standpoint is completely unimpacted. So this is the point of the blue-green deployment. Okay? So let's come back to this in a second. I want to kind of talk to you about a few more things, and then we'll get into this. So that's kind of tecton at a high level. We'll kind of show you what this looks like in a diagram form. But just be aware that this is another open source uh, project as well as an open source foundation. This was Knative build. One piece of Knative was so important to the market at large this ability to manage a pipeline and build in cluster, that it got separated out and became its own foundation at this point. So that's how excited so many different vendors are about it. All right, so contributions from people like CloudBees, Google, IBM Pivotal, Red Hat, and many more. As a matter of fact, there's a Google person here, an IBM person, and a Red Hat person here today at this conference. So you can ask any of them. There's CloudBees as well, where Oleg is. You can ask any of them. There he is. So you can ask any of us, hey, what's going on? Because this is all the stuff that we're working on as an example. And by the way, I didn't make this chart based on who I was going to be here. It just happened to work out that way. OK, the, PR, the CRDs, right, custom resource definitions based on pipeline and task. And of course, you build these reusable tasks as images. You build your own custom images to do what you need to do. If you have a really complicated build, it's not a simple Maven build anymore. As a matter of fact, you have, uh, you have actual C code in there. You have to run it through some form of a very special C compiler. As long as it runs on Linux, you can make it automated this way. It does have to run on Linux. Okay? This doesn't work with Windows containers yet. And certainly, it doesn't work with Solaris containers or HP containers or anything like that that I've ever seen. But if it runs on Linux, you can make it one of the tools in the tool chain, and you control those images and those steps. Okay? So if you look at it from this perspective, the pipeline is actually this virtual representation of a series of tasks and a series of resources. One resource is the Git repo. Where am I going to get those? You know, where am I going to do my Git clone from? That's pretty obvious. And then I have a task with multiple steps inside it, and maybe another task with multiple steps inside it. 
and then maybe it produces an image that goes into a, a, another resource, an image repository, and eventually the result is to deploy something to your cluster. That's the ultimate goal. And so you might have a final step, which is nothing more than using cube control, or OC, or KN, if you're using K, uh, uh, K native, you can do a KN deployment using that tool. It doesn't really matter. As long as it works against the Kubernetes API, you're good to go. OK? This is kind of how you should think of it, though, to map it into what you already know. A task is a pod, and steps are containers in that pod. I showed you that when I was uh, running that little pipeline. We'll show you that again. OK, so the task is a pod. The containers are those steps. So just keep that in mind. Each of those containers is one of those steps in there. OK? Now, let's talk a little bit about Istio, and then we're going to have a little fun with our little demo, or we're going to cause all kinds of havoc, one or the other. OK, so Istio means sail. Like many Kubernetes terms, there's, it's a Greek nautical term. Kubernetes itself means helmsman, or ship's captain, or pilot, or governor. Most people refer to it as governor, right? In other words, there's someone in charge of all our sailing vessels. And the sail, think of the wind in your sail, from an Istio standpoint, it's directional. Helps you with direction more than anything else, as well as propulsion. But in this case, you can kind of see that it's a code-independent polyglot solution. It does not have to be Java. It does not have to be Node.js. It doesn't have to be Python. It works across any of those solutions because it works at the pod level. You can do things like really smart canary releases with it. You can do things like a dark launch with it. And these were not capabilities you had in raw Kubernetes. Raw Kubernetes always had the ability to do a uh, blue-green deployment. Easy. All you had to do is go in there and manipulate the, the service and change your labels, and you had a blue-green deployment. Super easy. But a canary deployment, it could not do, OK? At least not in the traditional sense of a canary deployment. It had some specialized capabilities around the readiness probe and liveness probe and things like that, but I don't count that. Also, you couldn't do this concept of a dark launch. We'll kind of show you what those things mean here. But you also have the concept of fault injection. You have observability, the ability to get telemetry out of your application. And of course, if you have a whole lot of different components, all these microservices, this stuff matters. The most favorite popular feature of, of Istio is actually the MTLS. So in other words, I can encrypt things over the wire. And if, if you're in my Istio presentation, I'd show you that, right, where we have A calling B calling C. And by default, that's in clear text. It's an open, flat network in a Kubernetes cluster. And what if you have security requirements to say, I work on a team where you can't look at my stuff over the wire? So with MTLS, we can encrypt it over the wire as an example. So Istio has a lot of really cool things inside it, OK? Architecturally, it looks like this. It has the data plane, which has your application component pod, your jar file, your NPM, your pip, whatever it is that you have, your C++ application, your Go application. That's living there in one container in that pod. And then the sidecar is living right there with it. The sidecar is based on this thing called Envoy, another open source project that comes from a company called Lyft. You guys don't have Uber here. Right? You have Get and you have Yandex. But if you had Uber, you might also have Lyft. Lyft is Uber's competitor in the United States. And the Lyft team has created this really great open source proxy called Envoy. And that's what sits there to in intercept all the traffic in and out of the pod. So it's hijacking all the traffic through that pod. So just keep that in mind. And that's its job. And then it can apply certain rules policies, enforcing certain routing rules and certain policies, and also capturing telemetry at the sidecar level where you don't have to change any of your application logic whatsoever. So this is the awesomeness of Istio, that you can add all these additional capabilities that you often want in a microservices world, but you don't have to do it with writing code using Netflix OSS. No Eureka, no Ribbon, no you know, tools like that, no Spring Cloud annotations, if you're familiar with those. It's just all in, um, all in the sidecar. There's also a control plane, and so let me show you that control plane, because it's just running out here as another set of pods, okay? So let's go over here. Uh-huh, there we go. OC get pods uh, in Istio system. So there's going to be an Istio system, and you can see there's policy and pilot and the ingress gateway, and that's actually what these guys are interacting with, is the ingress gateway, as an example. And then Grafana, and then there's Prometheus, and Jaeger, and Kiali, and we'll show you some of those in a second. But all this is actually running out here as, as in this namespace called Istio System. All these things which extend Kubernetes and give you these new CRDs, those controllers that react to those objects are just other pods. So that's another thing that you'll have to, you'll have to get your head around. As an operations team, which pod has that capability, and where is it at on the cluster? And as a matter of fact, um, Let's see, oh, wide here. 
right? Which node is it on? And you can see this one has a ton of nodes in it. So which worker node was it placed on? It might be that worker node is having a problem right now, and we gotta go chase that down. In one situation, I was working on an Amazon environment with my team, and we were doing a heavy bit of load testing, and we actually destroyed one of the servers in the Amazon data center, because it went away. The node went away, and of course our performance dropped, and things started falling apart. We filed a ticket, and they're like, yeah, we had hardware failure. So guess what? It's still a computer at the end of the day. There's no magic here. Computers can fail. So those nodes that you see here are important parts of this, right? So that's what this node over here is. Okay, so this one's running on Amazon. I'm running on Azure for the other cluster. Uh, let me do this, though. Let me clean out these completed pods here, get rid of those two. Okay, let me also run one more pipeline uh, just to do this one more time. Let's get, we got green out there, but let's get the canary one out there. Oh, and this one, I was going to have a little fun for you guys. I can't actually say or can't spell this, but, you know, I can copy and paste it, right? How about that? Whoops. We don't want bonjour. Is it privet? Something? Privet? Close. Something like that, okay? But let me get my test sorted out here. Uh, test good. Let's see. Okay. Yep, all green still. Fantastic. So get status. All right, good. I made it, you know, that. I don't know if that'll take that. I've never tried it before. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, dun, dun, dun. This could cause all kinds of havoc, you know, using Cyrillic letters and, <laughs> and a git commit. I don't know. Um, let's see over here. This is where I was making the update. Let's double check it. Okay, yeah, there it is, right? Where's the canary color? So now I need to start that pipeline. So start the pipeline again. So again, the same process I had before. And you can see there's this Tecton pipeline run. And as a matter of fact, you can use that tool. What are my resources? What are my tasks? Okay. And then, of course, what are my pipelines? These are my pipelines. Uh, dun, 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 right here. And there's this one is the one we're interacting with right now. And then, of course, the actual runtime instance of it. Uh, let's see here. There's the pipeline runs. Okay. And the pipeline run in question is the one at the top of the list. I need to talk to them about this. It shouldn't be at the top of the list. I've got to scroll all the way back here to get it. Okay. And then you basically say, I want uh, the logs from that pipeline run, dash F. Uh, that should do it. Oh, what did I do here? Da, 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 da. Oh, pipeline run. Da, 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 da. Run. Okay. Let's run that. And so, again, it's got to go through the process of setting up that disk. That takes time. And now you can kind of see it's doing its git clone. Okay, you can see there's my listings and just stuff I use for echoing things out so I can see it run. And then it's got to go into the build source. All right, so that's building. You can see our blue and green are up here. So we'll let that build, but let's have a little fun with blue and green. Okay, so I have, my, I have Firefox Safari, and then I have a couple of little uh, Google Chromes. I have basically an Android, and I have an iPhone, Google Chromes here. And so let me try this. Let's switch everything to green. And so let's switch, switch them to green now. Okay, so we had blue and now everybody's green. Now, here's what I want you guys to do. For those of you who have a phone, you guys can help me out with this. Go to this link right here, bit.ly burr 10. And we'll see if we can blow things up. Somebody who's watching online right now is going to make an attempt to, you know, be nice. I just hacked this thing together myself. So bit.ly, burr 10, you know, this could fail miserably, right? You guys agree? But why not? Okay, so I'm loading it up here on my phone. Let's see if it'll get connected for me. So it's green. Okay, everybody green? Well, here's the beauty of the blue-green deployment, right? If for some reason someone goes, holy crap, we didn't want green. That's not what we wanted. And then you can basically say, go back to blue. Everybody blue? Okay. So that concept of the blue-green deployment has always been super easy in the, context of, of, um, in the context of Kubernetes. But all we're doing now in this case, just to show you what it looks like, is we're running this thing called a virtual service, right? This is another kind, another custom resource definition. This is part of Istio, see networking Istio up here. And it's basically saying everybody that's coming in, we want to wrap, we want to uh, send 100% of the weight of the traffic, 100% of the weight of the traffic, all users, all transactions, to the version blue, which is defined as this destination rule right here. So we have a blue, version blue, okay? And it's simply looking at the label of blue. So who are my blue labels? So, uh, come, come over here. 
uh, kubectl get pods l version equal blue. So the blue pods are going to get called versus the green pods. OK, you guys ready? Uh, oh, let's go green. OK, so here's the green pods. Let's switch back to green again. OK, watch them switch over. OK, so here's mine. There we go. We're green now. Fantastic. Look at that. It's worked like two times in a row. This is amazing. Don't you guys think it's amazing? I'm messing with your phone right now. But look what it's doing, OK? It's actually telling you the pod identifier that you're getting that response from. So this is, again, a hacked demo to kind of make the point. So there's the bonjour that I typed in. You saw me type that in. There's the count, the state associated with, with that pod. And you kind of see it's just going back and forth between the two pods that also have that green label. If I come over here now and basically look at it, so that's just this guy and this guy. And you can see there's the name right there. Okay, so the MSX6, that's that one right there that's serving your request, responding to your request. And let's actually have a little more fun with it. Let's go kill it. OC delete pod. Let's just wipe it out just to see what happens here. Might as well live dangerously. And look what happens. You fail over to the other pod on your phone as well. Okay? And all this thing is just a simple little polar using JavaScript, right? We can look at the JavaScript code. It's very straightforward. It's just a little bit of little polar here. Where'd it go? Uh, right here. Okay. You can see it's just basically curling this endpoint and just getting a read on it. Oh, getting read on it, and then putting up the information in this browser. Okay. Now we have our canary deployment. Let's go see how that looks. Okay. So let's do this. Watch kubectl get pods. Okay, and now we can have a little bit more fun with this. So the typical canary deployment is basically you, you want only a percentage of traffic to go to the user. Okay, in this case, blue or green, everything went. You're blue or you're green. So let's actually come in here and look at this from the perspective of uh, source main, and this is Istio. You can kind of see I have all these virtual services in here. And all you're doing is applying this YAML. So I basically say kubectl, uh, replace in this case, because I'm replacing the existing rule, source, main, istio, and that one. So if we watch, that looks like it took effect. But this basically says 10% of the traffic will go to the new one. There, oh, did you see it? 10% of the traffic goes to the canary. So you'll see it just flash up there every now and then. So there mine went. So you anyone else get a canary? You win a prize. The prize is a nice yellow screen. No, I'm just kidding. OK? <laughs> so that concept is very powerful. So in other words, we want 10% of the traffic now going to that specific uh, uh, build that we just shipped out, which was the canary with the, um, with the you know, you can kind of see it there, just flashed up there. OK, so that's one way to think of it, 10% of the traffic. And if you look at the rule, it's very straightforward. Uh, let's go over here. You can kind of see, not that one, that's the green one. Where's my canary? There we go. OK, so 90-10, 10 percent of traffic. You specify the, uh, the actual number, OK? You decide what the split should be. And this is important, because if you had regular old pods, you get a 50-50 split. Two pods, 50-50. Four pods, 25-25-25. In other words, the built-in load balancer to Kubernetes is just standard round robin. In this case, you can actually can say, I want 2 percent of my traffic. But let's have a little bit more fun with it. Let me also do something like this. Let's actually, yeah, let's do this. Let's actually make it so that if you're an iPhone, who's, a, who's my iPhone users out there? iPhone users, OK. So let's see here, uh, dun, 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 canary. And all right, let's make it so iPhone receives the, the yellow, the canary. And this is my iPhone over here. You can kind of see, based on Google Chrome, I set this up as iPhone. This one set as Android. And then this is now yellow. You get the yellow one? Are you guys having fun yet? This is how I keep you awake after lunch. OK? All right. So all right. And now the Android people are feeling bad. I know. I'm sorry. I got one for you, too. Let's switch it. Let's forget those stupid iPhone users. Let's go to Android. All right? Let's make the Android people the cool ones with the canary. And then we'll get that replaced. And then there we go. And notice my iPhone went back to green. So you can basically slice and dice your user base and you can use anything in the HTTP header. In this case, it's using user agent. That's it. All right? User agent. I uh, even have one here for mobile. So if you want to basically just pick up on the mobile flag that's in the user agent. So all mobile users get this, but my desktop users do not, as an example. So, so here's my mobile users. All got the canary now. And you can basically run this thing out there. 
And then you, of course, have to monitor it. You have to look at the metrics associated with it. And with Istio, you have the concept of Grafana, which is one of the workload tools that you have. So in this case, it's looking at blue, and I can look at the blue traffic. There is no blue traffic, right? Because blue is not even being routed to at this point. Oh, let me refresh this, because it's not been refreshed since I redeployed everything. But here's my green. So green, you can kind of see, is no, uh, not performing as well as it was, because it's getting less traffic, OK? And we actually built a different tool for this. It's called Kiali. And so Kiali, let's see how Kiali behaves here. You can kind of see what it's doing. It's trying to monitor this in real time. It's also trying to understand the distribution of things. You can even see the Istio config from in here, like if I want to change these rules on the fly within Kiali. This is actually something Red Hat contributed to the upstream Istio project. So you can also get a feel for how things are, are done. So if you actually have several microservices, you would actually see which one is underperforming, which one is having errors. Because in that call chain, you want to make sure that they're all good and healthy to respond to your users in a clever way. In this case, it's a fairly flat architecture. So you can kind of see there's my blue, green, and canary. Uh, and they, they even have a nice little traffic animation here. Let's see if it actually shows correctly. Yeah, so it's going to canary and green. OK? And if I want to come over here now and say, nope, I don't want all those changes. Let's flip everybody back to blue. I can do that. And let's see if that works out for me. Fantastic. OK. So I, hopefully that was a lot of fun. Let me just run you through a couple more slides, and we'll be, we're nearly out of time here. All right? Just to kind of make, make sure we're cool on these terms. Have, hopefully had some fun with you there. OK? So the concept of blue-green deployment is the build runs down the pipeline. It lands either on blue or green. The colors are arbitrary. I made them a certain color so you could visually see what it looked like there. And then you flip the router. And if there's something wrong with it, if it dies, you flip it back. That's the beauty of the blue-green deployment. But it means you can deploy ever rapidly because you have two copies in production. It does mean you have to double provision your infrastructure. If that thing takes 10 gigabytes of RAM, you need 20 gigabytes of RAM. OK, keep that in mind. The Canary deployment is very similar, except that you have a subset of traffic, a subset, my Firefox users, my iPhone users, my users in Brazil are the only ones who see this. Anything in the HTTP header will work, OK? And then you grow that traffic or shrink that traffic, depending on what's going on. OK? And then, oh, I, get, I didn't show you the dark launch. The dark launch is this. It's concept of mirroring. So let me try one more time. I'm going to be out of time here. Uh, let's try it real quick. OK? So we got all our blues. We're going to flip everybody to green real quick. We're going to flip everybody to green. Uh, but here's what's going to happen. Everybody's going to be on green. Come on now. Do, 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 there, there it go. I think it's all green. Maybe I made it blue. I have to go back. Let's go look. <laughs> Let's go look. Um, uh, this one right here. Maybe I made it blue. No, it's green. Everybody should be green. OK, interesting. Did I do the right one? Canary? OK. Stern. Let's go check this out. But here's the idea. OK, it is working as I expected, but it should have been green. I'll have to think about this. I probably made, messed something up somewhere along the way. Uh, we could go fix that real fast, but we don't have a lot of time. But look what's happening here. I'm logging on my canary pod. Do you see the logs coming out of it? Because all these transactions are actually being sampled and sent also to the canary pod. And what this means is I can deploy a thing, nobody sees it, and I can monitor its behavior, its health and well-being, and decide if it should stay in production or not in production before any human sees it. And that's the concept of mirroring. You can kind of see this is just a simple command right here, mirror. And that's another feature that Istio gives you. So think of that as the dark launch, right? and that kind of capability. There's a bunch of resources available to you. Again, the slide deck is available here at bit.ly pipes and pods. But make sure you have access to all of that. And I think I am officially out of time, right? What do you guys think? Was that fun? Thank you, Burr. Um, we actually have a lot of questions in the chat, but we don't have time to uh, ask them here. So we're going to proceed to the uh, discussion zone, and people will bomb you with the questions afterwards. Excellent. I love questions. Right. Thank you very much for coming, everybody. Thank you.